donor advice fund platform and and uh, this catacap spin out from that and uh, we're just making it po- we've raised a couple million dollars for trying to solve this uh, problem of the friends and family gap uh, which keeps 90 percent of african-american owned businesses under four employees and we're one of the very few funds focused there everybody's focused on startups because white folks have startups and nobody knows about the the sole proprietors that have been around three years heading toward 100,000. So we, we fund them and it's been an evergreen fund and the money goes back to the nonprofit CDC. Now it can go into your own private donor advice fund account that, which you can get for $250. And so you will invest, you will give and the money will come back and you will suddenly have that money back and what you're gonna give that year. So you will double your giving every three years or so. And we think people are going to really like it uh, because they will be suddenly uh, more abundant and they, and they can rely on it. Um, and it's a donor. So this kind of tool, just to step back, has been available if you have a family foundation with $5 million for decades. You could do it with $250,000 in a donor advice fund with this kind of philanthropic creative investing for you know seven or eight years. Now you can do it for two hundred and fifty dollars, and and you can get the money out as low as five thousand dollars. So, uh, it's it's really deeply democratic, and and all those new innovation, big innovations, are done by folks who don't need the money, right? If you have a five million dollar family foundation, you don't need the money. If you can move two hundred fifty thousand dollars without thinking in a donor, you don't need the money. So this is the people who need money will be more powerful givers, and so we'll be up online within a day or so. And then we're also moving on to our focus thing with Warren Wilson College and their biomedicinals and everything around that nature-based entrepreneurship. So anyway, I'm working a long time and it's it, it, it could be up later today, it could be up uh, tomorrow. I'll, I'll drop the link in, into OGM once it's up and, uh, you know, and, it, and it's working, you know. Uh, so anyway, it was, it was fun to do that partnership. So that's, that's, that's my check-in. Well, uh, it looks like I'm up. I find the silence at the beginning uh, not so productive. There's an ideology around how it allows uh, the sleeping mind to present new ideas up for consideration. But that's not my experience of what happens. I find it unnerving to just sit and have so many smart people have nothing to say. Uh, There should be a rush to want to communicate and it's not what's happening. What I see is that we're living in a time with a very tight logic. The logic is that the temperature is going up. The production of GDP and the use of energy are going up. even in the second derivative, that is the rate of use of fossil fuels is worse now than it was a year ago. And the rate is going up. And that's pretty weird. Why, how people can ignore that logic is obscure to me. Uh, I see that we're, there are basically two groups of people. One, which is the largest group, is looking at climate change as an opportunity 
to grow and change, to improve society, uh, or to improve one's personal wealth. Certainly the rush to, to get finance capital into the third world is to support big business, not to support local people. Uh, the other is uh, a much smaller group that understands that we're really in a tight way and we've got to cut uh, the production of CO2. We've got to try and stop the rising temperatures. Uh, even if it's very hard, uh, we've got no alternative except to try. Uh, and so I'll stop there. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Looks like the Brady Bunch here. <laughs> um, I want to talk about an event I attended last night online. Um, it was run by the Chester Children's Chorus, which was started 30 years ago by a music teacher who decided to meet with seven um, kids from an underprivileged district. Uh, in, in an underprivileged city in Pennsylvania. And um, over the years, it expanded into a wonderful program where they're able to take kids every week to a university and teach them how to sing classical music in harmony. And it, I think it's just a wonderful thing. And then they've expanded it to add a math program. They're going to add uh, language arts. But um, he was presenting some statistics about um, yeah, the gap that exists from <laughs> communities just uh, north or west of this place to, to the kid uh, in terms of um, yeah, the support they get. And uh, so there's structural problems that um, he says, if we didn't have, if America was supposed to be was the way it's supposed to be, these kids would get what they need and they'd have opportunities equivalent to the other areas. And uh, yeah, I found that message hard to take. Um, so, uh, so that's a dream. I'd love to see it expand into other cities. I'm sure there are similar things, but you see, the good ideas need to be surfaced somehow and brought, at, you need pilots and the people to run them. Yeah. So um, I was showing earlier this chord keyboard and for fun. <laughs> this is, um, so Sam Hahn has studied a lot about Douglas Engelbart. And he prompted me with the question, what would it take to run Doug's NLS system today? And that prompt got my mind thinking in all different directions and doing the research. Well, what were the benefits of his NLS system? It means online system. It's from his 1968 demo called The Mother of All Demos. You could just search for that on YouTube. And um, that was the first time that computers were being seen as improving productivity and helping uh, the normal person, office worker, uh, yeah, just to get things done better. And his whole life was about improving processes and augmenting our intellect. And um, yes, yeah, Sam Hunt said that at the end of his life, he still didn't think we had made enough progress. We'd made very little progress um, towards his goals. And maybe it's a, a little bit higher now, but still. Um, so what's getting me thinking, yeah, I've looked at some of the research and um, it's possible to go through the code and <laughs> see it, but uh, there's no on, well, I, I don't think there is a way to get access to whatever became of NLS. Um, we're going to see if Sam could find out more about that. But uh, 
taking the concepts forward, um, Christina Engelbart, his daughter, is uh, running the Douglas Engelbart Institute, and they have a demo called Hyperscope, where you could play with it, and she's still working on expanding that. So it's funny how like things were put away, brought out, put away again, brought out. So there was like a 2006 project, and then this was like 2021 when this latest Hyperscope came out. So um, Sam's got me thinking about functional programming and uh, data log uh, for a uh, database. Uh, so all these things are jumbled in my head and I just figured I'd check in here, say hello to everybody. And good to see you all. Good morning, everybody. Doug, are you where it's morning or are you where it's night? Uh, it's going on towards midnight. Yeah, thought Malaysia. So. Yeah, so good, good, good evening to you. Um, so uh, I've been in an exp in an exploration that has come on me in the last week or so. I've I have wondered for decades about how change happens and have thought about it, talked with people about it, worked on it. Um, and um, this pattern, I found myself exploring this pattern the last few days. I've talked with Ken a bit about it and with uh, my friend Chauncey and with Jane, and I just want to share it with you. I'm thinking I'm what in the question of how minds change and that's kind of a stand-in because we're inter we're interested all of us in how minds change and how behaviors change and how policy change and how social norms change and so forth but i'm kind of looking at the how minds change as a starting point there and my hypothesis is that it happens in f in four ways or is provoked in four ways uh, one is fear or aversion don't want that uh, one is logic or persuasion one is seduction, or call it attraction, and one is power or compulsion. And um, <laughs> that's probably too neat and tidy. It doesn't, you know, doesn't yet allow for mystery. But those are I'm sort of chewing into those and thinking that the progressive palette, the conversational palette in most of the conversations that I'm in, feels puny. For the language feels sloppy, which suggests to me that the thinking is sloppy behind it. Uh, I hear lots of wishing and intention. It would be good if, it would be nice if, we should, they should, like that, which of course begs Ken, the Ken Homer question of who's we, buddy. Um, um, I hear a lot of reliance on logic as if facts ever changed minds. Um, I hear a lot of reliance on fear. Um not enough focus on um, on seduction. And I don't mean the sexual connotation of that that word has in this culture, but of like, you know, um, um, something inviting. Um, um, uh, for me, this has been a pivotal element in my theory of change for decades, is that if I can show people something that's working and exists and is groovy that they want, um, you can't say it's impossible if it's already there. So that's sort of where, where I've been oriented. Um, I observe that uh, that we uh, here I'm using the progressive world we has an aversion to power um, because of an aversion to how power has been wielded in the world, um, which gets in the way of recognizing that power is the capacity to make things move, to make things change. Um, so I'm I'm chewing on all that and doing a little bit of writing on it uh, that will probably be uh, a starting point for the living between worlds webinar next wednesday noon pacific time um, and that's what's going on with me this morning
I'm going to say good morning and um, I'm good skipping uh, my check in today. Thanks. I asked a question on a call yesterday and I realized it crystallized a question or questions I've been having for a while. Uh, and it may seem like a silly question, but I think it's a serious question and it goes as follows. What would you do if you were made ruler of the world tomorrow and you wanted to be a benevolent ruler? Meaning, what would you have us do? What would you suggest people try to do? You can get into the how would you get them to do it? That gets really twisty and complicated quickly, but just like... What are the things you would recommend doing? What is the what is the menu of activities, beliefs, principles, rules, laws, uh, methods, systems, uh, principles that you would apply and how? And I think that when I hosted the four pop up, the four separate calls about governance and like what works in governance, that was my attempt to to address some of that. Um, and I'm really interested because I, I think that the current set, the current stacks, as I call them, are broken. Um, capitalism, we have a really nasty flavor of capitalism running amok. Democracy is being undermined left, right, and center. And I don't think it's doing a good job. <clears throat> Democracy and the rule of law and the press are not apparently enough to rein in bad actors who are really focused, um, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if our present systems aren't doing so hot, um, what replaces them? And how can we think broadly enough to think beyond what's up? And I've been reading stuff about, you know, degrowth and uh, the need to, you know, uh, the, the need to cut uh, our energy consumption to zero immediately, which destroys the economic system in the world, which has all these knock-on effects. Like really, what, if you were ruler, what would you have us do that would create a better world within our lifetimes. And are we supposed to respond to that or? Uh, there's no responses in check-in. That's just, uh, oh. if, if, when we're done checking in, if you feel like jumping in on that, please do, but uh, hold I have up. some thoughts, but I will. Okay. I, I, I would love that. And I think you do, because neighborhood economics is a big piece of that, right? About, about trying to sort that out. But hold that off until we're done checking in, please. I'll check in enough to say that I haven't got a COVID cogent check in, so I'll pass. I'll go. Hi, everyone. Um, it's interesting. I usually are. I'm on this this call, and I I want to have conversation. I want to have banter. I want to progress things. But today is completely different. I have grown in my own thought process of wanting to do. Um, I love the Quaker approach because I get to really sit with myself and notice what who I'm bringing to this conversation before talking. 
I can notice all the judgments I have or the opinion, strong opinions I have or the make wrong I have or the delight in all of it. And it's actually very, it's subdued today. It's, it's very listening and not, that stuff is not showing up. It's really just kind of fascinating how, um, I'm, who I'm bringing to the call today. And it, I gotta tell you, it feels more freeing. I feel more relaxed. And there's so much to do, I get it. So, but I feel like I, I have more power to do that when the timing is right. Thank you. Can can you all hear me? Good morning. I have been recently playing around with the idea of a poor human emotional needs actually being um, evolutionary non-negotiables in the characters. And when our core emotional needs are not usually in a development phase, our development has been, uh, it has its consequences that have, have been documented in some ways, but I would suspect that there is much more to be explained in the implications of these. Uh, no? Still no? We're, we're getting a lot of ambient noise. If you speak directly, yeah. it's going a tiny bit louder, but we're getting a ton of noise from the people around you. Yeah, I might um I might hold off on the check in because it's just got super loud in the last five minutes. And um if it, it if it we can just, find a different space in a little got, bit. It just it's got much better with holding the mic close. Yeah, it's much better okay. with the mic right okay. now. Okay, all right, thanks. Um I'll yeah, so just starting from, from the beginning, I've been thinking about the impact of core emotional human needs not being met. And not as, um, I think we, they tend to be viewed as, at least the way I perceive them to be viewed by many is like fluffy optionals. And uh, I think they're evolutionary non-negotiables. And I think that when they become negotiated and when they become compromised, there is a long-standing impact and a really harmful impact. And what the lens I continue to explore is the ability to connect with one's personal power, right? So if um, core emotional needs and their deficits translate to how we impact the world or how we can impact the world around us and what reserves of personal power we have available to us. Um, I'm tracking how this might have consequences for not just the individual, but the collective. And it's been about a week and a half ago, I learned of a contest that Hay House Publishing was running. Uh, they're accepting book proposals. And so I put together a book proposal called The Physics of Need. Thank you. And um, I got that submitted and I learned about that in August, if that pans out. So I'm feeling very uh, inspired and excited about that. That's my check-in.
Good morning, afternoon, wherever you may be. Evening, night, midnight. Um, I've been thinking a lot about initiation. I don't think weird people have any appreciation for what initiation is or what it serves in terms of the human soul and, and the progress of culture. And I think that um, the Eurocentric tradition has lost a great deal uh, by forgetting about initiation. And the way I understand initiation is that um, there's a call. This is Joseph Campbell's model along with some other people. You know, there's a call and you refuse it. You usually refuse it twice and the third time you have to take it because it's like, okay, I have to take it. And that involves a descent. And in the descent, you go into the lower world, which generally is considered to be the world of animal spirits and, and plants and plant medicine and rocks. And, and while you're there, you get dismembered. Everything you think you knew falls apart. You can no longer hold on to the old way. And it's incredibly painful. Um, kills some people. Those who survive reintegrate and come back. And they, they, have, um, they bring back some, some treasure, some gold, some ability to uh, navigate in this world because they've descended into the world below ours. And it brings back with them a wealth of knowledge. And I, I think we're sorely in need of the knowledge of people who've been initiated. My understanding is that a lot of uh, indigenous traditions right now, uh, the roles have been reversed. The elders are asking the youngers to initiate them, but they no longer know how to operate in this world. I'm thinking of the Kohi uh, and their latest message coming again. Um, and some of this comes from my work with Maladoma Same 30 years ago. I said, you know, he, he was sent out to, uh, to work in Europe and the U.S. by his, his tribe. And, and he said, you know, I run into more indigenous people uh, in the U.S. than I ever did in Africa. And his theory is that when you kill the indigenous peoples, their souls go into the earth and they return in the grandchildren of the, of the killers. And so I'm hoping that that's waking up in people. But um, I think, and, and here's the thing. Um, when you return from initiation, you get a new name because people recognize you as different from who you were. And so they, 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 there's a recognition. My understanding here is that if you don't get recognized for your initiation, your soul goes, well, I must not have done a good enough job. And it calls you back to a deeper initiation. And you keep going through that cycle, which ends up as a very traumatic cycle because people are not recognizing, hey, I've been through some shit and I'm different and no one is seeing that. Um, so I'm just wondering how all that is. I'm not wondering. I, I, I'm not wondering how that is playing out. I'm seeing how that's playing out in our culture today. There are so many uninitiated people just wandering around like, like billiard balls after a, a pool break, just banging against each other with no coherence. And uh, I'm really curious what this next initiation is going to look like because it's going to be big. It's going to be on a grand scale. And it's going to be uh, pretty dismembering before we remember. So that's what's on my mind this week. Yeah, Ken, you sounded a little bit like Michael Mead to me. <laughs> no just, drums. We just, we just flashed on my screen a few minutes ago. Right, no drums. <laughs> it's funny, he hasn't been playing drums in his, in his current um, iteration. Um, yeah, I, I agree in that I think we're all about to have a a big time initiation, whatever that whatever that means. Um, so I just wanted to share briefly, check in um, two things. 
Um, and I just celebrated my 78th birthday on Tuesday. Um, and, and so you reflect birthday time. Um, it was it was kind of exciting celebration, but it also makes me realize that um, <laughs> that in today's world, you know, for me, it's a constant. It feels like a constant triage about where I'm putting where I'm where I'm putting energy in, um, and um, you know as you kind of move towards some immovable finish line, whatever that means. And it's not, it, it's not anything that feels um, immediate. Um, to me, I, 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 I want to say that I, um, geez, I devoted whatever, whatever meager skills and talents I might have to the right causes uh, and balance that with, a level of personal life and a level of humanity. God, I didn't realize this. Um, I had some work done on a on a on a car, um, a 2000 VW Beetle Bug Yellow, <laughs> which I absolutely love. And um, one of my dearest friends who passed away said, "I've never seen." Um, someone in their car so congruent <laughs> which i absolutely love it's got a big sunflower in a in a vase that's on the dashboard of the car that came with it um that my late wife bought me but anyway a guy did some work putting in a new headliner in this car and it was a very simple transaction and there was, as a matter of fact, when I picked up the car, he said to me, how much did I say that I would charge you? And we ended up in about a 30 minute conversation <laughs> about how human connection is missing from the world we're in and how he has chosen, you know, um, to live in a certain way and run his business in a certain way. And it was a beautiful kind of heartfelt conversation. And, it, you know, I shared a little bit about how I, I too, um, couldn't practice law anymore because it was so incongruent with my own soul and spirit. Um, and it was one of these beautiful, beautiful um, moments of authentic connection to another human being and, and, the, and the recognition of how much of that is missing in the in the in the strange world that we seem to all be living in and how soul satisfying um that was the other thing that i wanted to say was um i'm reading uh, bill yuri's new book possible um and i highly recommend it to everyone sitting here um you know bill yuri was the co-author of getting to yes He's got um, 40 years of incredible high-level stories since then. The book reads um, as much a memoir as a as a book sharing um, principles, and I'm I'm reading it like I would read a book of poetry. Um, it's that um, it's got that level of incredible um, wisdom and knowledge um, in it. And it's not just for folks that are, you know, quote, conflict resolution professionals, but it really is all about um, creativity um, at some profound level, uh, which at a, as a bottom line is what uh, resolving conflict is all about. So that's my check-in and I've got to leave for a, 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 another meeting uh, a little before the top of the hour. And thank you for, for listening. Mike, you've probably picked up that we're 
in the check-in round, you've arrived near the end of it. Um, Judy has not checked in it yet. And if you want to, which you appear to, please go ahead. I'm sorry, did, did Judy want to go first? No, go ahead. I also have to leave at uh, one o'clock my time, unfortunately, but I'm um, at the top of the hour. Um, not too much to check in about, although I was delighted to see one of our colleagues on the um, uh, at the conference I spoke at on Monday. Um, here in Washington, the conference was the International Society for Systems Sciences. And um, this is a, a global organization. They move around each year. They've been in Berlin, South Africa very recently. It's a total hodgepodge. It's just about as broad as it can be from earth system sciences to understanding environmental impacts to systems philosophy, systems theory. A few people who are still uh, trained in cybernetics. But um, I gave a talk on four scenarios for tech, truth, and trust. And it's based on a talk I gave two weeks ago at the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware. I will send the slides around to everyone. These are version 2.0. Um, so I prefer you not share them to the world, but um, if they inspire thoughts, if you want to make corrections or argue with me, that would all be good. By far the most important slide is the one showing a two by two matrix for um, uh, the two, the four different scenarios. So the, the up down uh, driver for the future of our information environment is the amount of trust with more trust being up. And of course we're going down. And, and, and then the right left is the more interesting and that is ease of sharing. And as in most of these things, the um, upper right-hand quadrant is the golden quadrant where we have lots of easy sharing and lots of reasons to trust. And the two go together because if we have uh, a lack of firewalls, if we have uh, fewer people concerned about hoarding their their oil, their, their data, um, we will be able to compare and contrast all the different versions of reality out there. We'll be able to get the best data by combining the best data. Um, but it was uh, it was uh, well received. Um, I hope to write it up and uh, help people understand that there are some technologies that aren't getting enough attention that could actually help us both enable more sharing, particularly of private information that can be anonymized, and allow um, people to put more faith in what they get. Other than that, I'm heading to Seattle on Friday night to help my mom celebrate her 87th birthday on a Zoom birthday party. Um, hope to catch up with a few of my Microsoft friends, former colleagues, and uh, take a little bit of me time to walk along the shore and in the woods. Um, beyond that, life is fun, life is interesting, and it's starting to get hotter than hell here in, in Washington. <laughs> Well, I'll make my check-in pretty brief today. Um, basically, I'm trying to sort through the various nonprofits that I work with to identify where to best give my energy and what it is that would benefit from my thought process. It seems as though many nonprofits are struggling because they're getting declining memberships and the participants are aging out and the younger folks are too busy to come in. And so I think that might be a topic for a deeper discussion with all of us contributing to that at some other, other time as a topical discussion, because I'm really concerned. And it's not that the younger generation doesn't care, they do, but they're just pretty busy with their lives. Somehow they seem busier or to feel busier than at least we did at our time. So I'm spending a fair bit of time trying to figure out how to help those I'm working with and whether I should identify some new ones that are doing some more progressive things.
I believe that completes our check-in round. And can I retract my knot and, and check in? I would be very pleased if you were to do that, Dave. Because I was inspired by what Stuart was saying. And maybe it maybe like, oh no, I do have a check-in. Uh which I was thinking it's, it's the parable of the two sons. I like caught up with my my two kids in the last couple of weeks. And um and they're so interestingly different on the kind of the dimensions we've been talking about. One one of them has just gotten accepted into Y Combinator. So he's gotten his $500,000 check to start a company that they're not really sure what's going to do, but it'll do AI. Y Combinator, I guess, has this manual of details about how you start a company that does, you know, kind of soup to nuts about how you jumpstart a rocket ship to, you know, unicorn status or whatever it is. Uh, and he's about to head into his three months of intensive, you know, you should live with your co-founders kind of experience. Um, and it's weird, right? Because it just feels like we've kind of, we've created this device, which kind of deliberately extracts as much value as it can from the rules of the system. You know, it takes advantage of everything you can and takes, just tries to suck money out of it. And maybe it contributes to society too. I don't know, not necessarily a requirement. Um, and then the other son is the one who's been like debating whether to become a Buddhist monk and he's moved off to, uh, he's on, he's, I think, staying on Wemis Island, you know, kind of up by Orcas. Um, and he's kind of homesteading and he's trying to, he found a woman who has some land and has a house that she'd like to rent out, but it's not really ready, doesn't have a bathroom or a shower and things like that. So he's kind of helping her put it together, but she's kind of grumpy and hard to work with. And, and you know, doesn't nobody has any money and like everything's kind of cobbled together. And uh, her, his girlfriend is like this, you know, woman who's been debating becoming a Buddhist nun for the last few years. Is they're, they're, like, they're really grounded. They're really, you know, like as emotionally healthy as I can imagine being. And the, you know, then this, the living situation they're in is just so painful, you know, it's like they're, they're it's very personal. It's very, you know, but all the people are a little nutty. Uh, you know, the housing here, she said, I can't live in this house. We have to go somewhere else. Uh, you know, she's working on an organic farm, picking vegetables. Um, and it's kind of like the two extremes, it feels to me, of like, you know, kind of what we want the economy to be, but do we? And then what we don't want the economy to be, but, you know, there's some advantages to it. Uh, anyway, it's really fun to watch the two of them and see, see how they play. In this case, our protagonists are Adam and Zach. Uh, and they're delightful. And it's really interesting how they're playing out the spectrum, the ends of the spectrum of what's possible right now in some interesting it's ways. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Um, and thank you all. Uh, now is the moment to share any links you'd like to share. Uh, Pete is doing so as we speak, as is Ken. Uh, and jump in with whatever you want to pick up from what we were talking about. Um, and I'll, I'll add one tiny thing, which is Judy. It feels like some of the, the thinking you're doing about the nonprofits you help uh, is married somehow to Patty's question and Ken's question and Stuart's question about initiation yes. and how we're missing initiation. And, you know, places where people come together to do interesting and good things feels to me like um, great places to initiate, to to connect generations and do all those kinds of things. So maybe that's a framing that that is helpful to you. Um, Stuart, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, very, very quickly. I wanted to acknowledge and thank Kevin for um, kind of motiv motivating me to think uh, about, you know, where I might um, be useful. Um, that was in a, one of the OGM and a little bit of a private um, email conversation. And I also wanted to uh, comment on one of the things that, that Ken said that just um, is reverberating the notion of of younger's uh, younger people meant, uh, initiating older people, um, and, and it reminds me of the story of, of Chip Conley, um, who went to work at um, Airbnb, I think, um, expect and and was hired to be the elder mentor to take care of all these young folks, and and then he ended up writing a book because. He got so much mentoring from the, the 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 younger people, and I think there's a way in which younger people are, you know, um, coming into the planet, being born at this point in time, you know, they're confronted with a lot of stuff that we weren't, 
And, and so, you know, early on, um, wisdom seems to develop and there's a lot to share in terms of what we'll call reverse mentoring. And I just wanted to um, punctuate that because I think it's an important um, awareness. Uh, Mike, go ahead before you have to bolt. Thank you. I apologize for not uh, being on screen. I'm taking advantage of these 20 minutes to eat my lunch. It's the one open time. Um, I, I wanted to ask a favor and also second this idea of streamlining your volunteer activities or, or at least uh, maximizing your impact. I, I'm, I'm called into too many different volunteer efforts from the National Academy to the Internet Society. Um, and, and I just, frankly, I, I, I every so often, just when I'm thinking of leaving, stepping off the board, something really cool happens. And then six months later, I remember how frustrated I am working with these organizations where the people with the most time have the most time because they have the least to contribute. <laughs> and it's really frustrating. But um, I, I, I am very excited about the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. Um, it, it's 35 years old and we honor three people each year. One person for lifetime achievement for doing something like what Arthur C. Clarke did, either science fiction or engineering or environment. One person for imagination in service of society, often a science fiction writer or a movie maker. And then somebody who's an innovator, which is great fun. We've had Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. This year, we have the head of the Monterey Aquarium. We have the institute that runs the Webb Telescope and the Hubble Telescope at, as an organizational awardee. And we have Nicholas Negroponte, um, who did so much in the 90s when Jerry and Esther were doing so much to influence our, our digital future and at least our vision of what could become. So the homework question, two parts. Um, given that these are the kind of people we honor, I'd love your ideas on who we should try to recruit for 2025. And the more immediate concern is we need people to introduce uh, and do a, a back and forth dialogue with some of these people. So if anybody knows somebody who has worked with Nicholas Negroponte or somebody who, I mean, is, would be interested in spending the evening with us and having a free dinner at the French embassy, uh, let me know. Um, as I say, it's a fascinating group and um, it's, a, it's a good cause. Uh, I, I like to say that our, our bumper sticker is fostering future thinking beyond the next quarter, beyond the next five years. And it's getting harder and harder to get people to do that. So again, um, if you're gonna be in DC on November 18th, I hope you'll hope to see you. And if uh, not, uh, hope you can engage in some way. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, you'll probably get some emails on that from different people. Uh, Gil, did you have a suggestion right away? There's a good queue built. You're muted. Looking for buttons. Um, uh, I have some suggestions, but I missed, Mike, who the first one was. I got Negroponte and the Hubble people. Aqu aquarium. The aquarium. head of the Monterey Aquarium. She's right. been running it for the last 20, 25 years. But the main thing is I, the Negroponte one is the one that I think uh, this group would probably be best able to help with. Well, that could be Jerry Mikulski. Uh, that, I, that, if, he were, if he were willing to fly from Portland? Mm -hmm. I don't know um, that I'm the best person to to introduce Negroponte, that's for sure. Well, you're, you you're been great to introduce certainly the Esther. second best, Jerry. You're certainly Esther, the second best. Esther was Esther was was given the award two years ago, uh, both both for the conference and for um, uh, and for uh, ICANN. And do you know Carl Schrader's work? Uh, barely. I, I think he'd be good. I mean, you have to okay. remember Negroponte. It's like, oh yeah, Negroponte. I remember you. Anyway. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and and Dave makes the good suggestion to have Joey Ito talk about Negroponte because Joey picked up Negroponte's right. baton basically and would know a ton about what happened there. He probably also knows where all the skeletons are buried. Well, he he helped us uh, uh, convince Nicholas to do it, but we have to find a time. We have to convince him to come and visit us in in Washington. Nice. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you so much. This I'm I'm sorry to take advantage of the wisdom of this crowd, but. Uh, it's an amazing crowd. <laughs> why, why we're gathered here. Thank you. Um, Doug, you're, you'll have to unmute first. There you go. Good. I want to come back to your question about what we would do if we ran everything. Awesome. Please. And the first thing I would think of doing is figuring out how to give away that power because having it concentrated would be pretty dangerous. But my serious thought about what to do, I've been proposing what I'm calling a lifeboat strategy. That is climate change is gonna affect the world in different ways in different places. Many are gonna fail or already have, uh, but some will succeed and be viable centers where living is possible. And I think that what we should do is be looking for those places where viability uh, is plausible and what to do to strengthen uh, gathering resources, tools, food, ideas, places, uh, and trying to make them sustainable through the worst phases of climate change. So I'm calling that lifeboat strategy on the idea that if lifeboats are, are successful, uh, they will evolve into more complex organisms, which I'm calling garden worlds. Uh, and that's a... Uh, Align into the future, which I feel we can work for. And the thought. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Kevin. Uh, yeah, you asked a question like, what would be great if it's, there was suddenly more of it? And actually, uh, there's a really interesting thing. So I've been working with indigenous people uh, and, and folks around uh, the rights of nature, and which they say is just a... Uh, those laws express their thinking. And, and we're working with a tribal group over in South Carolina and um, with uh, the Cherokee here. And there's a really interesting big thing happening that this is the thing I think should happen lots of places. The, the, um, the Interior Department uh, as represented by the, the National Park Service is coming to the Cherokee to say, we want you to in, in, uh, manage uh, the land uh, using your principles, and we will follow it um, because the UN and I, everybody is saying, you know, reinstituting indigenous principles. And they're getting so much money that they're having to like go talk to Cherokee Nation people because they're doing it in a really big way. But um, so that's a thing I'd love to see set as a standard. And then it's, you know, it could be a thing that a city or a county or other folks could follow. And, that, you know, <clears throat> legislation can follow practice. Uh, but you can, you, can, you can do so much with regulation that you don't have to go to Congress to do, you know, uh, just act like the utilities and change the rules uh, and the operating agreements and things. And so... Uh, that's the thing I'd love to see grow. I could talk about more of the things, but I mean, I think that's a, it's going to happen all over the park service. The Cherokee uh, Eastern Band seemed to be the first place, but it's a, it's a replicable design template that, uh, you know, and they're doing it. The only way you get, you don't get anything done with the tribe. You do intertribal things or, or you get stuck in tribal politics. So there's a good intertribal group that we're, helping to connect that didn't know each other so that's kind of cool and then you just sit and wait as white folks to say now you can come in so anyway but um it's a standard that is transformative and uh, it's being adopted so that's 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 not a trivial uh thing that's happening so that's i want more of that Kevin, that's totally lined up with things I've been looking at, thinking, and curating in my brain. It starts from a thought that I named something like humans who, humans who know what they're doing are really good for the landscape. 
Mm. Like human, mm -hmm. humans who are alert and awake to how you manage land, and that mostly means indigenous traditions, are really good for the landscape. They make it a lot better. Uh, and then we made this mistake of, you know, John Muir, Muir and others said, no, 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 we need to protect, you know, nature preserves, et cetera. And we shoved all the people who knew how to take care of the land off the most beautiful portions of land. And, that yeah. was a, and then we gave them we gave them the dingiest, driest, most awful pieces of land we could we could sort of find because everybody else wanted to turn the rest of it into condos. Um, and that was a mistake. Yeah, you know, Ansel Adams was one of the principal villains. He believed in a pristine wilderness. And so Yosemite Valley, they had to deport the, the Miwoks, you know, right. because he didn't want any messy Indians. And so well, that is know, actually it's, not it's, true, Kevin. They were okay. driven out long before Adams came along. Check it out. They were driven out in the 1870s. Okay. That's the story I've heard. So cool. So uh, I have in my brain, it wasn't Adams who kicked the Miwok out of Yosemite. And that comes from a, uh, an OGM call. Uh, so that was very likely Ken saying that before. Um, and and if you've got oh, any, nice please, you, if you've got that in a book or a story or a video or anything like that, please pass it in so I can uh, add it as evidence to um, to that node. Um, but in general, we sort of uh, shoved people who knew something about managing land off the land in many places. And now there's a land back movement. And also what you said from the national parks really gives me heart. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. You want to say something else? Yeah, just one brief thing is that uh, there's also um, the expansion of uh, my friend Sean Paul with Ajito Verdes uh, doing really amazing things with uh, pine resin uh, with um, indigenous of the poor Apache people in Michoacan. And he figured out how to invest in community owned assets because what you get is what's called usufruct rights, the rights to get the fruit of the pine. <clears throat> and if your family doesn't do it, other families will do it. But, but there is collateral. And now they're expanding to the mosquito people in Nicaragua. And uh, it's a really interesting... Uh, the typical thing is the leader says, I'm, I hold title and he moves to Cancun and everybody gets screwed. And this is a way around that. So anyway, that's just a, there's some really interesting uh, positive legal things happening uh, on indigenous fronts. And that's that's one of them. So that, that's all. Thanks, Kevin. Ch changing the rules changes a lot of stuff afterwards. So that's why I think it's important. Um, Pete, thanks for your patience. Of course, um, and, and uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, this is actually, uh, I have a wish and a curiosity and it's uh, particularly difficult to go right after Kevin. <laughs> um, but uh, I've had this wish here before and I guess I still have it. Um, uh, we do a lot of our interactions uh, on a soapbox. Uh, so each of us comes and stands on the soapbox um, and propounds. Uh, the good thing is that we're all very interesting to listen to, and, and uh, I love, you know, what everybody says, uh, especially Kevin, for instance. Um, but uh, if, if I kind of, like, think over the, the arc of our calls, it, the, the modality in which we find ourselves, that soapbox modality in which we find ourselves, um, communicates to me a lack of curiosity and a willingness to propound instead. Um, and I think, you know, the, the OGM folks are not high on the list of people I wish would stop doing this. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, we're a small group of people trying to change the world. And, you know, in, in society, we have a dearth now of people listening and people asking and people being curious. And I wish we had a modality, maybe a minor mode, doesn't have to be all the time, but I wish we had a minor mode of asking each other and being curious rather than being assertive and uh, you know, forceful and trying to communicate and, um, uh, and convince everybody of you know, something that, that we find um, deeply held and deeply believed. Not that, not that I, I want people not to have deep beliefs um, and uh, hold them deeply and communicate them, but I feel like we're missing a, a kind of, you know, a, a set of chords uh, that we, we don't play or, or harmonies, maybe. 
I'm curious, I'm curious how many people in the room uh, agree with Pete and feel that way, because my read is actually considerably different. I find us very curious, and I find that a lot of our dynamic is sharing what we've seen or heard, which sometimes gets soapboxy, but often is like, well, the Miwok weren't pushed out by Ansel Adams, it was someone else. And I, I know for myself, I'm like curious to a fault and busy squirreling away all the things that we drop in the chat here in some larger memory. So I feel like, and this may just be my bias because of, of my take on it, uh, that I'm coming at it that way. But it feels like we're very curious and interactive on these things. We don't rest on a topic long enough to solve anything. Um, and in that case, we're kind of flitting from flower to flower. But I don't feel like we're propounding, like, like, your your notion that we all stand on we take turns standing on the soapbox and propound struck me as a novel concept and didn't resonate for me. So I'm wondering for whom does it and doesn't it resonate? And I'm I'm I may just have a bad read on the group. Um, Gil, yeah, and, I, and Patty, if you'll be patient for a second, I'd like to hang on this uh, for a bit. Go ahead, Gil. I started listening the same way, but then Pete distinguished OGM from the rest of the we, as I understood Pete what you were saying. Um, uh, you know, uh, implying that this group is is less soapboxy and more curious than others that you're in, and certainly in the in the check in session, it's kind of soapboxy because there's no interaction by design. Um, um, so I so I share the concern outside of here. I've been really struck um, at how in and this may just be my you know commercially old man get off my lawn act going, but I've been really struck by how incurious I find younger people to be these days. Uh, extreme case. I have people who say, "Can you know? I, 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 I'm you know, I'm 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 moving in the sustainability field. I want to talk with you. I want to get your ideas." Uh, we get a call, and they talk the entire half hour, never ask a question. And I'm just like, I'm fascinated by that. It's like you know, you're calling to so-called pick my brain and do no picking. So anyway, so they, 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 that's then one of my current beefs is these kids aren't curious. My other current beef is that everybody's running stop signs these days, but that's another topic. Uh, and Gil is pointing out that I may have over interpreted what you said, Pete, as a critique of OGM, where OGM might be the exception, but I'm not sure. And maybe your comment was that we are in soapbox society where that's what everybody does is they take turns on the soapbox and we don't engage with each other which is a, a thesis I would agree with a lot more. So I think I was listening to it, what you said very much from the OGM and, and our interactions perspectives. I, I, I mean for us to change. Um, and I, I find our, you know, the, our, our typical modality, which is a little bit conversational. I, I, I could imagine us being a lot more curious. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I take your point, Jerry, you know, we are each curious and interested, but we go like one level deep, you know, so uh, was it Ansel Adams or not? You know, and then we move on. Um, uh, I it, it's kind of like be the change you want to see in the world. Um, <laughs> I don't think we if if I were somebody else watching this, uh, the the thing I would come away with is it's a bunch of people who are very knowledgeable, very heartful, um, and they really like hearing themselves talk. <laughs> you know, and. Uh, uh, which isn't a bad thing. I don't mean to to criticize, and I don't mean to complain, but I I I think we don't. Um, uh, you know, the, the funny thing is, uh, I would love to ask, say, you know, any any one of us actually. Uh, I'd I'd love to ask uh, any one of us about what I know their specialty is. You know, uh, I know you know somebody knows a lot about something, and I want to ask more about it. The, the even more interesting thing is, I think, and this isn't the only thing that I find from curiosity or asking questions, but an even more interesting thing than asking somebody what you know they know is asking somebody, uh, what's the most surprising thing you've heard this week? Or uh, what's a story from your past that really affected you deeply? Um, we all get in our presentation modes and we're used to, we're used to pitching. Um, so we give pitches to each other. Uh, we don't tell stories that surprise, you know, I'm, I'm not often surprised by what somebody says. Um, and I wish I were more. Um, Ken actually is doing a great job of, of uh, self-prompting, um, self uh, you know, 
uh, amazing stories. And so reading the plaques and, and seeing a story from Ken about, you know, 1970, whatever. And it's like, whoa, what? <laughs> Ken, you had that experience? Somebody in the world had that experience? And it, I, I know that person. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like we could get a lot more variety and uh, reciprocal curiosity, mutual curiosity, something like that, than we do. Um, and again, this is not something I want to see us do all the time, but I feel like, um, you know, if every other, every other week is a check-in, we hear a lot of uh, our, ourselves pitching rather than, you know, uh, interesting stories about the past, the future, our hopes and dreams that, that are not necessarily it's hard to tell what's interesting when you're doing a pitch. It's hard to tell what's interesting, you know? So I've got my three things I can pitch about. And I guess you want to hear today about, you know, uh, programming with AI is a thing that I could pitch about right now. Um, you could ask me a question and, you know, I could, I could find out that, uh, that, huh, I know something, you know, that's super interesting to other people that I would never have volunteered. Um, so that's it. Thanks, Pete. Thanks. It's a, a good inquiry for us. Uh, Patty, Patty, please go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to, um, I could speak on that real quick. I think, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Way? Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so I, I agree with, I agree with Jerry. I agree with Pete. And I resonate with what Gil shared. I think that um, I agree with Jerry's perception that we are, uh, seem to be an outwardly very curious um, and receptive. And yeah, just has come to this room with curiosity. And I wonder if, um, but I also resonate with Pete's share that it feels like there there may not always be that level of. Um, I think what's coming to mind for me is like the energetic of receptivity. If I if I may speak in those terms, I think that I wonder if the nature of this particular room of people is that we we may tend to we this this room may tend to dominantly be folk who. Um, tend to like lean forward into the world, right? And we're doers and achievers and um, presenters and that energetic, the like leaning forward energetic tends to be different and experienced differently than like a very receptive leaning back energetic. Some some would call it the masculine and feminine energetic. Um, but I think I just kind of wonder that if, if the sum of this particular room may just be bodies who tend to embody the like you know, doing energetic in the world, and we're feeling that that um, like forward leaning nature in the room, and maybe perhaps the the sense I I I am also getting Pete is that um I I don't always sense that there's even even for the pauses that are brought into the space I don't always sense that there's like a lot of space to to receive um and and to have a shared receiving experience I don't know how to put that in different language. Um, but that that would be my reflection. And I'm really curious about um, what Gil pointed out, just a general, especially in the younger generation, a general um, unwillingness to ask questions. And, and again, Gil, I don't mean to put words into your mouth if that wasn't if that wasn't exactly what you're trying to to suggest. But um, I, I perceive that and I sense that, too. I embody that at times. And I, I'm really curious about the conditions that are um, what conditions are present that are creating that tendency for for young for younger folks. Um, transitioning into, I think the share I was I was hoping to bring in earlier. I feel like we've kind of moved away from the topic a little bit, but I think the um, the sense I have around intergenerational collaboration and things one generation could learn from another, I'm really struck by. Just the older I get, I think I um, I've lived long enough now to see the impact of if I um, if I have a loved one or I know someone who is in relationship that is um, unhealthy or even abusive or toxic in some regards that that impacts the the person who's receiving uh, on the receiving end of the dysfunction right and we can hear it in I can hear it in their speech I can hear it in how they think of themselves how they talk about themselves and I think that what occurred to me kind of recently is the longer that I'll just speak for United States culture. Um, folks here live and are embedded in a culture that is inherently um, dominant uh, power over culture. There's the uh, you know things of capitalism and the white body centric prioritization and value of lived experience and all the systems that have arisen to support that. Um, these are really in many ways dysfunctional unhealthy systems and I see that impacts in folks who have who've been alive longer. 
Um, it's, it's easier for me to see and hear how they speak of themselves, how they speak of relationship. And I think that impacts we as maybe um, in, in the younger generation, it seems clear to me that there are folks even younger than I who have had a chance to eradicate or at least get on top of some of those um, dysfunctional influences a bit earlier in life. And um, it, it, it changes who they are and how they present and how they um, show up in the world. And so I think that there is a lot of, um, I, I consider myself very lucky to have been born when I was born, but I also recognize so many of the limitations and plenty I'm sure I don't recognize of what it what it meant to be born when, when I was and had the lived experience that I do. I'm seeing the impact of um, the instant gratification culture and how that has just been, uh, you know, normal for a lot of my life. And so many um, strengths or qualities that I perceive myself to be lacking maybe, or this could be improved upon, I see uh, embodied more in, in, in those who were born before I was, you know, a few, a couple generations older than I. And I would love to see more spaces where there is intergenerational collaboration, that there are spaces that are created for the, um, yeah. if there's just collaboration of such different, the different worldviews that tend to be embodied by, let's say the, um, like my parents' generation, and um, Gen Z, I would love to see more spaces that bringing bringing those cohorts together and seeing what can be co-learned and um, how each generation might be able to benefit from one another. So I'd love to see that personally. So that's, that's a bit on my riff on that. Thanks, Patty. Um, Ken Gill, then I'd like to jump in as well. Um, so three things. First, uh, thanks, Pete. Um, I'm glad to know somebody's reading the Plex because I don't get a lot of comments on it. <laughs> um, this come because uh, my oldest friend, Steve, I've known him since 1970 when, when we met in seventh grade and, and we talk every week and he's like, you have so many stories. You got to write these down, man. You can't, you can't not, you can't pass this world and not leave this behind. So he's really encouraged me to write them down. And the Plex was just a good venue for it. And I, if you're reading them and, and you like them, thank you. It's good to know. Um, seconds, an anecdote. Uh, I just wrapped up a, a coaching contract. I had a cohort of six people all in their 30s. And the first co-development session, they, they said, what are we going to do about Gen Z? They don't want to do anything. They want a reward for showing up. They're not willing to put in anything to go over and above. And I'm listening to them complaining about Gen Z. And I, I said, well, speaking as the only baby boomer in the room, I just want to say, Hey, you kids, get off my lawn! Because <laughs> it was like, oh my god, this is this is just a this is a generational conversation that I have heard my entire life, you know. And it's really interesting to move through the generations and me now in the older end of things and and seeing the younger people saying the same thing that was said to me when I was young. So I think it's just one of those lenses that shows up. It's a cultural lens that shows up. Um, and the third thing is an answer to Jerry's question of, you know, what would I what would I do if I was put in charge of the world? Well, first I would run away, you know, because I don't want to be in charge of the world. That's way, way too much for me. But if I were and I had to make one decision, it would be two decisions. Um, it, it would be one to use a jury pooling system to create all new governance structures. We should not have anybody who's who's been in governance actually there doing the work now because it's it's so screwed up. But Sortition, yes, exactly. Like, you know, if you just, you, there's been experiments that show people who are just pulled as a representative cross-section and given good facilitation make amazingly great decisions. I've seen this work. I know it works. Um, so that would be number one. Number two would be um, take 50% of every single country's military budget and devote it to living re instead of killing re, as Bucky Fowler would call it. Um, I think if we, if, if people were, were, having access to clean water and clean food and they had a roof over their house, over their, 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 their selves and a clothes on their back and food in their belly, a whole lot of big, big problems in the world would be solved and they'd be much more open to and, and much less uh, oriented towards terrorism and everything else. So I think that would, those, those two things would make an amazing difference. And the third would be to build an army of elders who would be equipped with soup and blankets. And anytime there's a, uh, a conflict in the world, we don't send young men who are filled with testosterone and trained to hate. You send a bunch of old people with blankets and soup, and they say, you look hungry here. You look cold here. Tell me what's going on. What happened? What's, what was the start of all this? Because that would be a great use 
of people's life experience to go in. They've learned how to how to work through lots of conflicts, and and that I think would also lower the temperature a lot. So those are the three things I would do if I was in charge of the world. Thank you. You have added greatly to the arsenal of interesting and useful uh, tools that might help us fix the world, Ken. Thank you. That was a great set of contributions. Love them. Um, back to Pete's thing just for a second before going to Gil. Um, one of the reasons I've been unsuccessfully harping occasionally and kind of giving up on the harping, but we started OGM with this a lot, was of asking other people to um, curate something any artifact and share it into the big fungus, into the into the space between us, so that we can create an artifact that gets better over time instead of having conversations that repeat. Uh, because one of the one of the features of modern society is we have no shared memory. And so we constantly scallop near the surface and repeat conversations over and over and over. And I think we don't repeat so much here, but we still do. Um, and we also are curious and interested in so many different things that we're always touching a little bit here, a little bit there. But if as we did that, we were leaving behind stigmergically artifacts that were useful to us and to others outside, uh, that would, it, it, over time, it really pays off. It really pays off. Like, like knowledge ac should accrue. And I don't think what we're doing here does that very efficiently. And my entreaties have not um, not met with a lot of success. And I don't, I, I, I think I gave up after a while. And I, I love our conversations. I love our groups. And I love my curation, which is trying to do that thing. So, uh, I, I and I don't know if that even feels like a, a, a an approach or a solution to the, the problem you were uh, stating, Pete, but we can go there in a sec. Uh, Gil and Judy. Um, actually, I'm raising a hand on behalf of Jane, who's been sitting here listening. If you'd permit awesome. a, a, a new face to have some words here. Yay. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm often a quiet listener to your calls. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm, I, I've, I've grown curious because of uh, Ken's wonderful comments on indigenous peoples and the reference to uh, UN standards echoing um, uh, indigenous uh, principles for land management and living. And I've grown curious um, how many of you have a direct relationship with land. Hmm. that you live on? Are you all urban peoples in a concrete sea? Do you have any suburban existence in this group of, of people on OGM? Or even pots on the patio. I have two pots on a terrace. Ken is sitting in nature. Patty is in, on land, right? Because The reason I'm curious about it is because it seems to me that what we want to evolve into is a new humanity that is indigenous to the earth again, that is connected to land and knows a place extremely well and loves it deeply because it gives us life. And um, the trend is humanity is urbanizing. There's going to be like 80% of the population in concrete dominated cities. And more and more corporations owning what used to be middle-class suburbia, owning the property that contains the biodiversity potential to repopulate substantial insect biodiversity and which upholds bird populations and is an important part of ecology. And there is a conservation biologist in Connecticut named Doug uh, Tellamy who organized something called homegrownnationalparks.org, hmm. which is a national registry that advertises the amount of square acreage. It's, it's a staggering amount of land under the authority and control of homeowners. Hmm. And he began to teach them the power of returning their properties or a portion of their properties to native plant populations that support insect biodiversity. And it's becoming the hot thing to do in Connecticut among the wealthy people to transform their properties into examples of um, natural habitat and not just use um, extraneous plants from nurseries. Um, 
and he's starting to teach um, the gardening the gardening club world of America through his book and this organization where you can um, register your piece of property and the changes you've done to it or what you hope to do for it um, into a self-awareness among a population of being indigenous to a place, knowing a place, knowing the ecology of the place. To me, this is a radical. And I don't know how exactly we accomplish that with an urbanizing population, but I know that the earth that would be worth living in is an earth where that has happened on a grand scale. So I'm hoping there's a hookup between um, local economies and UN standards and indigenous peoples mm. for what it means to have a direct connection to land and steward its biodiversity. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, it turns out I had run across homegrown national parks, national park before and didn't remember it. And it's like a cool, cool idea. Um, uh, Judy, you had also raised your hand about having land and so forth, and you're muted right now, so you need to unmute. It wasn't so much about raising land. It was in part because I think that looking at natural vegetation is very soothing. But I was thinking in terms of how we might pursue some of these topics in the future in whatever might be effective ways. But the, the key point that I'm trying to get my hands around is sort of the balance of curiosity and enablement that isn't so much a telling as it's an inquiring and a leading and inviting. And I think that culture has lost its ground in more recent years. And anything that we would want to do that would engage other people needs to include that somehow. And I don't know how to frame the topic, Jerry, so maybe you can frame the topic for a future discussion. But I really think that what I see missing is sort of that shared respect that leads to enablement, that leads to new ideas and new ways of doing things. And if we could systemize that in some way and understand it ourselves and then be catalysts for it in other settings, that could be something with a dendritic expansion potential that could be helpful. And that's kind of a, a toward like, what if somebody made you ruler tomorrow, what would you do? That, that's the sort of behaviorist thing that I would love to see happen. Okay, I don't know. The term ruler to me is more of an oversight than an invitation, but that's maybe because we need to redefine ruler. <laughs> uh, ruler just means you have the capacity to make things happen. I don't mean that you're the emperor and dominator of everybody, because rulers have certainly gotten a, a bit of uh, bad play for very good reasons. Um, I just mean that that the, the thought experiment is, what if you had the capacity to cause a, a large number of things to happen, but people were still people and you, you couldn't force anybody to do things, et cetera, right. et cetera. So, uh, I think that's worthy of exploration. So I'll stop. <laughs> thanks, Judy. Uh, Gil, well, I, and then I think Ken yeah, might very, have a call for us. Go ahead, Gil. What I hear in your provocation and the exercise that you're inviting is not about the power to do it, but about the imagination of what would you do if you could. It's inviting us to think about, you know, like what, what might, what might actually be better. Yep. Unconstrained from what can I do today in my little world, which is another dimension that we play at. Exactly. It's inviting us into the other dimension. Thanks. I'm hearing Beastie Boys in the background, sort of another dimension, another dimension. It ain't, it ain't me, babe. Anyway, no, I don't mean I'm hearing it. I'm, I'm, I, you just triggered that song in my head. Um. Mr. Homer, have, has, hast thou a poem for us today? Uh, you're muted. Of course I do. Uh, Yay! Back to Zimborska. Yay. Uh, a few words on the soul. We have a soul at times. No one's got it nonstop for keeps. Day after day, year after year, may pass without it. Sometimes it will settle for a while. Only in childhood fears or raptures, sometimes only in astonishment that we are old. It rarely lends a hand to uphill tasks like moving furniture or lifting luggage or going miles in shoes that pinch. It usually steps out whenever meat needs chopping or forms have to be filled. For every thousand conversations, it participates in one, if even that, since it prefers silence. Just when our body goes from ache to pain, it slips off duty. It's picky. 
It doesn't like seeing us in crowds or hustling for a dubious advantage and doesn't like creaky machinations that make it sick. Joy and sorrow aren't two different feelings for it. It attends us only when the two are joined. Joy and sorrow aren't two different feelings for it. It attends us only when the two are joined. We can count on it when we're sure of nothing and curious about everything. Among the material objects, it favors clocks with pendulums and mirrors, which keep on working even when no one is looking. <laughs> it won't say where it comes from or when it's taking off again, though it's clearly expecting such questions. We need it, but apparently it needs us too for some reason. Mm. That's beautiful. Ken, thank you. Vislava, Vyslav, she the dude. She is. She definitely is. Yeah, really an astonishing the, poet. The Nobel Prize Committee thought so as well. They awarded her that prize that for literature. Can. I just I just found the poem and put it in the chat. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Pete, thank you for your provocations on our process. We could pick up on that. Um, we could even have a call about that like we did long ago, mid-pandemic, um, next week. Uh, I would I would kind of like that uh, and see what it you know what it means and where it goes. But I'd, I'd be good for that. I just want to say one last thing before we, we go about this um, being connected to the land and and land being um, abused. You know, I moved to Marin County thirty four years ago, and there was hardly any French broom, and now it is just everywhere. Invasive species are taken over, and I drive down certain roads, and it's just lined with immigrants who are standing there waiting for someone to give them work right it's like we have a need for removing invasive species we have a huge population looking for work why can't we put these two together why don't we have a, a, a works progress administration that takes people off the street says go and and remove the invasive species and plant native species and we will feed you and clothe you and give you a place to live and a stipend and it would be a fantastic use of resources and money so, Think of the fun they could have with feral hogs in Texas. <laughs> so, you know, there's no shortage of, of, of people who bought it. There's people who love to work the land. I, this is something from Michael Mead, since he was mentioned earlier. Um, you know what the most popular hobby in America is? Like, blows all the other hobbies out of the water. Anybody have an idea, idea what it is? Knitting? Gardening. Gardening. There are, there's more money spent on gardens and more gardeners than any other anyone else. And Rumi says there's a million ways to kneel and kiss the earth, right? And gardening is one of them. And, you know, people love to, when, when I garden, when I put my hands in the soil, I sometimes have a feeling of I'm doing something that millions of people have done for thousands of years with put, putting my hands in and, and growing something. And it makes me feel connected to something much larger than myself. It's a transcendent experience. And we need more of that. That's that's also an initiation. So anyway, end of rant. I love that. Thank you. And thank you all. It's been fun as usual. Bye. Thank you. Let's Bye. be careful out there. Yeah.